We on? Good morning, church. And welcome to Bethel Thedford. And that's Bethel Pentecostal Church, 143 Ann Street, Thedford. You can't see the thing on, online, but the picture and the address is there. But people here can see it, but you know where we are. We're going to start off singing Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, and this is Communion Sunday, so if you don't have your elements, then now is the time to get it. And in case you hadn't noticed, Donna has joined our, our little uh, group up here. <laughs> so she's going to uh, play the chords on the piano, and she'll be playing the ukulele on different, uh, different ones as well. And if you follow her on uh, Facebook, she does an awesome job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're all a work in progress. As you notice, I flub up a fair bit. <laughs> okay, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together here today. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful weather yesterday. It was absolutely amazing, and so many people were blessed to be able to get out and enjoy the sunshine. And we thank you for waking us all up today, Lord. That means you've given us another day that we can serve you, that we can give you praise. Lord, we know that without you, we're nothing, and we cannot do a thing properly without your direction and your love and your help. And today is a special day we set aside every month that we can remember what you did for us. You sacrificed your son for us so that we could have a relationship with you. And we pray, Lord, that every day we become more worthy. Help us to continue to walk that path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so everybody has their elements there. You notice the, uh, the, the juice is a little bit pink. Well, that's because I've got the drinking box of the grape juice, and it's, I'm going to start getting the frozen stuff. I can't get Welch's grape juice anymore. They don't make it. Um, and I've been looking for the Concord juice, and you, you have to buy such big containers. Um, and it goes bad real quick. So we have, um, have this for now, but I'll start, see if I can buy, find some frozen uh, juice. The purpose for celebrating communion is to remember what Jesus did for us. Every time we take communion, the gospel is proclaimed, and we believe it, and we embrace it once again. We remember what Jesus did. We don't just remember on Easter Sunday. We remember every day. We use 1 Corinthians chapter 11. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if we each take the wafer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again.
Thank you, Jesus. Now you'll remember the disciples had asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And this is the prayer that uh, he had taught them. It's Matthew 6, there we are, 9 to 13. And we use the King James Version. Our Father, which art in heaven, don't be embarrassed, join in. <clears throat> Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And now we will uh, sing a few more songs. It's one thing about it, you get some steps in when we go back and <laughs> forth like that. I used to have one of those fit... Um, Fitbits. Fitbits, that's what it's called. And it's, uh, the thing just quit working. We're going to start off with, I need thee every hour. John 15, verse 5 says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Which means we need Jesus all the time. This says every hour, we need them every moment. <laughs> why things happen, the way they happen, and when they happen? Well, when we get to heaven, we'll find out why. So farther along, we'll understand why. Thank you. 
just a minute. Damn it. Okay. too maybe <laughs> it's easy isn't it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> okay turn your eyes upon Jesus like different languages that they um, put the words differently uh, like French English is the hardest one and we just do whatever we feel like doing I think but anyway <laughs> El Shaddai is uh, Almighty God or God Almighty because El is El or is God um, Adonai is Lord El Eliona I had written all of these out, and I meant to put it in here, and I forgot to do it. Erka Kama is, I beseech you, or, or I beg you. 
But there's, there's a purpose for uh, this song, um, for the words of the songs being chosen, because we want God. We beg him to be with us. We beg him to help us as he helped his people, his chosen people. So we're going to sing it, and we're going to do it well, right? Okay, everybody answers at once. something you're going to do it doesn't mean you're going to do it perfect to start with but you keep going and you keep going and you keep going um, and it gets easier and it it does get a lot easier as you're up there <laughs> Donna come up here and she says oh it looks so much different up here <laughs> and it does and it does my knees don't knock together as, as much as they used to before either I, you know you get uh, I still get nervous um, when I'm up here but God keeps us going, and it's amazing how he does that. He just keeps you going, and all he asks is that we continue to be faithful and to con continue to move forward, or as I had said once before, continue to push that boulder because he will move it when the time is right. All right, we're doing the Restricted Access Nations, and today we're doing Mali. The reason I thought we were doing it last, the week before last when I had mentioned it was I had already started getting ready for this week's. 
So it was stuck in the little gray cells there. Mali was listed 24th most dangerous uh, country to be in for a Christian. Oh, I missed that one, thank you. Never be afraid to point out when I move forward or backwards or whatever. Luke 10, verse 2. These are his instructions. This is Jesus talking to the people. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. This field in Thedford is his as well, and we continue to pray for workers for here as well. All right, we have the map of Mali, and you can see it's marked out in the white. And in 2022, they were listed as the 24th most dangerous. Now, in 2023, it has moved up to number 17, so things have gotten more difficult there. All right, the types of persecution or their profile. Persecution level is extremely or very high, and the type is Islamic oppression, organized corruption and crime, and clan oppression or families. The population <coughs> has 2.3%. Um, the population of Christians is 2.3%, so that's 490,000 people in 2023's count. And that's still more than it was in 2022, because in 2022 it's 476,000. The main religion is Islam. The uh, government is semi-presidential republic, so I'm not exactly sure what that means. And they have an interim president, Asima Goita. So the other president must have been uh, moved out or died or something. All right. Around 10 years ago, Islamic extremist groups took control of northern Mali, burned down churches, and forced out the Christian population. The Christian community there was, has never fully recovered. And Christians in that area still live with the threat of violent attacks, especially if they share the gospel. Mali is one of Africa's poorest nations. And many Christians lost everything during that time. Their homes, their businesses, and property. And they're still targeted, keeping them all in poverty. Mali has gone through great political instability in the last few years. And the leadership vacuum has strengthened the Islamic extremist groups and expanded their territory. This has put Christians at greater risk of violence in various parts of the country. Militant Islamic extremists abduct people, including Christians, and kill them, or keep them in sexual slavery. Others are put under pressure to join the groups, where they will be forcibly converted to Islam and made to fight. Some Christian parents send their sons away to safer areas to try to protect them. If somebody from a Muslim background becomes a Christian and escapes persecution by extremists, they will still face pressure from their families to give up their new faith. This can include being divorced, losing all the support of the family, social isolation, and even losing access to their children. <clears throat> the most vulnerable, the believers who convert to Christianity from Islam are the most vulnerable all across Mali. Christians living in the northern part of Mali and in other areas where militant Islamic extremist groups are active are at risk of violent persecution. Now this is a comment from a believer in Mali. Her name is Naomi. More than once my family sent jihadists to my house to harm us. But one day, while my husband was on a business trip, he was gunned down. He was killed for his faith. I have no idea what happened to his body. The changes this year. Mali has risen several places in the world list, world watch list this year, and this is due to an increase in pressure from different areas. The government sees Christianity as a Western influence and derides it. Jihadists are expanding and the general situation in the country is deteriorating fast. The country has seen two coups in the recent past, which has helped the jihadists expand their power and target Christians. It seems that the government is only effective in major cities, and those areas outside are in the hands, directly or indirectly, of jihadists 
who entice the youth into joining their ranks. The military junta asked the help of the Russian mercenary groups, the Wagner, to help them. Yet the Wagner group also targets civilians, including Christians. The prayer points, things that we uh, need to pray for. Pray for the stability. Law and order will return to Mali with militant extremists pushed back. Pray for the flourishing of open door partners work to help vulnerable Christians living or to earn a living. And pray that new believers will find fellowship with other Christians and retain their hope and their joy. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 4, 9 and 10. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you break the power of violent extremist groups destroying Mali's future. These are your children as well, Lord. And we know that you love them because their group keeps growing. We pray, Lord, that you take hold of the leadership in that country, that they, they will understand who you are, that they will see with their hearts what it is that you want done. And may new believers who feel alone and vulnerable know that your powerful presence is with them today, every day, and forge wonderful connections for those Christians with other Christians that will sustain them, that will strengthen their faith. Help them all, Lord. It's such a difficult place for them to be. But we give you praise, Lord, because they're still reaching out to you and more people are coming to you. We glorify your name, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, the book of Luke. Um, we did uh, chapter 14. Does anybody remember how that chapter started? Jesus was invited to dinner. And when he was coming to dinner, everybody was standing there watching him. Remember that? And there was a man there who had dropsy. Remember that one now? And Jesus asked a question that he didn't get an answer to. He says, is it right to heal on the Sabbath? He didn't get an answer, so we went ahead and he healed the, the fellow anyway. And then he proceeded to teach them. And he had gone through three parables. Absolutely, absolutely. Then we went, that brought us into uh, chapter 15, where the three parables were listed. And this time, he didn't explain them in between each one. He waited until the end to explain them all. The first of the parables, do you remember which it was? The sheep. How many sheep were there? No, how many? One missing. That was with one missing, yes. <laughs> there was a hundred sheep. One went missing. Now he was talking to the Pharisees through this, and he says, suppose you had a hundred sheep. Yeah, Pharisees would not have a hundred sheep. They hire people to do that. And suppose you lost one sheep. Well, again, they wouldn't take responsibility for it anyway. But it would be somebody else's responsibility. But that sheep was found. And then what happened? They, they had a party. They were full of joy. There were celebrations, and it was compared to heaven when one sinner comes to know the Lord. The next parable. The lost coin. The lost coin, that's it. It started off with ten coins, and there was one that was lost. Now remember, he's telling these parables to the Pharisees. First one was a shepherd, who they think is second-class citizens. Now this one, who owns coins, that's third-class citizens. So who's that? That's a woman. That's a woman. So I'm sure the Pharisees weren't really thrilled with these examples that he's given. But she lost the coin. And she found the coin. So then what happened after that? Party. She invited her friends and she said, celebrate with me. I found the coin that was lost. Then we took a break, and last week we did the uh, last part of chapter 15, and that one was the prodigal son, the prodigal son, or the son who was lost. 
But we always focus on the one that left, and we never focus on the one that stayed. But Jesus doesn't stop when the one that uh, had left came back. He goes on to tell us what happened with the one that stayed behind. Because he had humiliated his dad the same way as the one that left did. He had seen himself as something other than what he was. He saw himself as a slave instead of the son of the master. And he had seen himself as being used and abused on the farm. He had worked there all this time and he got nothing for it. And he needed to be reminded, what I have is yours. Everything that I have is yours. And that's what God tells us. We are all welcome to come in to heaven. Okay, we're going to carry on with uh, verse uh, or chapter 16 today. This time he's talking to the disciples. Now, the parable that he's teaching this time has got, I couldn't believe the number of titles of it. Uh, I think it was 19, 19 or 20 different titles. And what it says, trying to figure, <laughs> I, I just keep talking, don't I? All right, I've shortened it down. Um, he's talking about a manager, okay? Uh, there's a landowner and there's the manager. His uh, manager and he's uh, sometimes, he's, he's been called unjust, shrewd, dishonest, unrighteous, clever, crooked, crafty. But he's also called faithful, or the, the parable is called faithful with money, true wealth. And one is simply called a lesson for the disciples, which I think is probably what it should be. But I didn't, I didn't title them, so. All right, first off, he's talking to the disciples. Disciple in uh, Hebrew is Talmud, all right? So depending on what version you're going to be looking at. So a disciple is to be exactly like his teacher or his rabbi. And that's how they learn how to treat people, how they live. They learn to emulate their teacher. So they bear fruit, like the teacher did. The Talmud, or a group of disciples, would live with the rabbi in order to live in every single situation. Because that's how they memorize the teachings, because they lived with them all the time. And then they could go out and they could teach others. The Talmud lived exactly like the teacher, every moment of every day. Now, Jesus did things differently. He was also classified as rabbi, and that's why the uh, Pharisees would get so upset with him, because he's working with sinners, people that aren't of their class, and so they didn't like that, because they thought it was a reflection on them. But Jesus was doing what they were supposed to do. Stop looking at the outside. Stop looking at where they come from. Stop looking at what they're going through. Look at the heart. And that's what Jesus did. That's what God does. He looks at the heart. He found the ones that he wanted to follow him. The Pharisees made the ones come in and prove that they were worthy to learn from them. Jesus found the ones and drew them in. Because he could see, he could first, was to pay the rent. And the landowner got that. Well, his mistake was greed. He wasn't happy with what he was being paid for the job, so he would go back and add a little bit more for himself. That's where he was taking the money from. So we've got the, the landowner, we've got the manager, and now we've got the tenants, or referred to as peasants a lot. So we've got the three groups of people there. And they're the ones that reported the manager to the landowner. So we go to uh, verses 3 and 4. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So the manager is not trying to figure out how he can keep his job or how he can get his job back. He's looking to the future. The owner didn't ask him to repay what he took or what he collected for himself. So the owner is generous. 
as much as said, well, that's yours, but you're gone. The manager is banking on the owner's character, his character of mercy and generosity. Verses five and seven, five to seven. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? And the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. Goes to the next one, how much do you owe him? He says, I owe a thousand bushels of wheat. Here the manager says, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. So first, he has to work fast before anybody finds out what's happened. Otherwise, they're not going to talk to him. Then he gets the solution of what he's going to do. Next, the manager takes and reduces the contracts and he heads back to the landowner's office. Verse 8. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. So think about the reaction of the tenants, the ones that referred to as the peasants. They're thinking this manager is giving them a discount on behalf of the landowner, that he wouldn't do that himself, because if he's going to uh, be wanting more money, yeah, he'll take that, he might keep that himself. But he's giving a discount, so the landowner is being praised for this. Oh, they're delighted. The landowner who is merciful and generous. The tenants would be celebrating their master. Or, yeah, their master, who is the landowner. Verse 9. This is what Jesus says. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when they, your possessions are gone, they'll welcome you to an inter eternal home. So what does the landowner do after all this? His decision is between his reputation or the money. And for a man of character, what do you suppose it'll be? He goes, I want that money? No, the reputation. Proverbs 22, 1. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver and gold. So Jesus is saying the shrewd move is trusting the master, trusting that he is generous and merciful. Jesus is also reminding us that we have one major asset, one. Believe me, it's not playing the, or the keyboard. <laughs> our major asset is our life, our heart, our heart. And what we do with our life is what we decide where our eternity is. Luke 16, verse 9, and this is the complete Jewish version, or Bible. Now what I say to you is this, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves, so that when it gives out, you may be welcomed into the eternal home. You only have one life to live, so we need to use it wisely. Build friendship with people who can say to you someday in heaven, thank you, because of what you did or what you said or what you gave, I'm here. Thank you for sharing about our merciful, loving, generous Heavenly Father, who is the master of our life, if we so choose. Okay, verses 10 to 13. Someone who is trustworthy in a small matter is also trustworthy in large ones. And someone who is dishonest in a small matter is also dishonest in large ones. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who is going to trust you with the real thing? And if you haven't been trustworthy with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what ought to belong to you? No servant can be slave to two masters, for he will either hate the first and love the second, or scorn the second and be loyal to the first. You can't be a slave to both God and money. So the question to ask is, what do I entrust, what do I want entrusted to me both here and in heaven? 
All the while reminding ourselves that the better we invest ourselves here, the more will be entrusted to us there. Because when we get to heaven, we're not going to be lollygagging around. We're not going to want to. We're going to have the energy to do everything that we need to, to give God glory more and more and more and more. Here, as we get older, we get more sore. We, we, we seem to uh, lose more and more energy. My goodness, if, uh, if I had a tiny fraction of the energy that Allie has, I'd be able to go around the clock. <laughs> she tries. Fortunately, she managed to sleep a few hours a day. But you know, the kicker is here, you can't sit on the fence. Because when you're sit on, sitting on the fence, not make, yes, I'm talking about you. When you're sitting on the fence, you are making a decision. You're making the decision not to trust God. You can't do that. You have to make the decision on what you're going to do. So we focus on the one thing that is important, and that's on God. We need to focus on eternal life. We go to God first when needing to make a decision. We listen to the Holy Spirit because he gives us that prompting of what it is that uh, we should be doing. But don't ignore it. We need to listen to it because afterwards you think, oh, if I had done that when I, I felt like I needed to do it, I wouldn't have to be fixing it up now. But more important, we need to hold on fast to the Word of God. And that's accessible to everybody either electronically or on paper, we can get it. And now we're going to sing a few more songs. We'll finish off uh, chapter 16 next week. Oh, I got the list there. As the deer, that's it. <laughs>
Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That's Micah 4, 2. And it says, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of our God, to the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And as we sing it, it's almost verbatim.
Let's pray. After you have a drink. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us today. You tell us all the time that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're in the midst. And we thank you, Lord, that you were here. We thank you that your presence was here. We thank you, Lord, for being with us, for holding us close. We thank you for the lessons that you teach. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you be with each and every one of us as we prepare to leave this place today. And we ask that you help us to be more and more like Jesus. Let every step that we take encourage us to follow through, to be faithful always to you. Help us, Lord. We're only human, and we can only do so much, and we can't do anything on our own. We ask that you be with us at all times. Be with those who are with family today and celebrating special events. Be with those who are sick. We lift up Carolyn to you, Lord, who's uh, going through chemo for aggressive uh, lung cancer. We ask that you just touch her, Lord. Be with the doctors that are working with us. Increase her faith, Lord. Touch her and heal her. That's what we want. But you know what, uh, what is going on. We hand it over to you, Lord. And we lift up Daryl to you and ask that you be with him as he also goes through cancer. So many things, so many people, Lord, who are suffering, who are having difficult times. We could list off all of the names, but there's just so many of them. We know that we can always come to you with all of our needs, that we can hold them in our hearts, but we can cry out to you. When we don't know how to pray, we know that the Holy Spirit will interpret our groans so that our prayers continue to lift up to you. We give you all praise, glory, and honor, Lord, today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing, uh, God be with you. Is that going to move over? There we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless each of you.